I've got a confession to make. I don't like Bar Tetsu. I think it's, it's a bit crap. I think that Edward Barton Wright was a con man. I think he assembled some very skilled martial artists who were incredibly good at what they did. And he brought them together and tried to put his own spin on it, his own name across it, and sell it to fantastically wealthy people as a new art. And I think it failed. I think the whole thing fell apart. And the jiu-jitsu stayed as jiu-jitsu. Uh, the boxe francais stayed as boxe francais. Uh, Schwingen stayed as Schwingen. And, and Bartitsu was never a thing. I think the only reason that we have this modern movement for Bartitsu now is because it was mentioned in passing in a Sherlock Holmes story. And because of that, some very good researchers found out what Bartitsu actually was. And it was just a little note of, of historical interest. Until some people got on board and decided to recreate it. And I think what we have now is not actually what we had then. Anyway, that's confession aside. I thought, rather than just me rant in a video, which is clearly what I'm doing, so um, apologies, that was never the plan, I thought it would be fun to put Bartitsu on trial. So I invited my mate Tommy, Tommy Joe Moore, who um, I've recently done a book review of his combative thing. Tommy has also written this book. So I held it up on the correct side then, but so far that way that you missed it anyway. Um, this book here. Tommy is uh, the founder of the Bartitsu Lab, and teaches modern Bartetsu. I... Uh, yeah. I mean, I can't fault Tommy. He's a great guy. He's clearly very intelligent. He's a fantastic martial artist. Um, but he does Bartetsu, so clearly he's wrong. So I thought it would be fun if we had a debate where I effectively prosecute Barton Wright and he defends him. So this is a, a relatively long video. Stick with it, it's worth it. I think it's a really interesting discussion. And I think we cover some, some great points. And to be perfectly honest, I think by the end of it, we're pretty much in agreement. Apologies for the quality. Um, because it was a Zoom meeting, because Tommy lives a little way away from me, and in the UK we're still on lockdown, so that's the way it had to be. So, um, yeah, the resolution's not great, and the audio's not fantastic. But that aside, let me know what you think. Watch it. And see, am I right, or is Tommy right, or is it actually somewhere in between the two? I'll see you on the other side. We're going to put Barton Wright on trial. Then is that is that the 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 idea? Let's do it. So you're gonna you're you're gonna speak for the defence. I'm, <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna speak, speak for the defense. prosecution. I mean, in the same way, I might be defending Joseph Fritzl or <laughs> another. <famous. laughs> okay, so you're defending him because you feel he deserves defence rather than you actually feel that he's not guilty. I, I feel he has a human right to some defence. Okay. Um, okay, so the basic, the principle is I accuse Edward Barton Wright of being a complete shyster and a con man who was no good and um, and that because of that, Bartitsu is in effect, in its historical form, bollocks. Oh, um, savage move. Yeah. Savage. Okay, I think that the modern recreation, modern Bartitsu, and, and the modern arts that have been inspired by that, I think have got a lot of value to it. And I know some great martial artists. I mean, obviously not you, but, you know, some other great martial artists that are heavily involved in that. And and so you've got to give, give that some credit. But the original art, Bartitsu, was it actually any good? Well, let's see. So... Is that, is, is that your first firing salvo? Was it yeah, any good? Okay. Was it any good? Was there, was there anything of any value in original Bartitsu? Absolutely. If, if, if you think of the original Bartitsu, you think of any art, there's no such thing as an art, there's just curriculums or curricula. So if you imagine no one owns a hip toss, no one owns a lead off, no one owns a fuet de bar, you know, no, one, no one owns these things because they're so ubiquitous. The only things that arts have are curricula, the order in which or the collection of which we teach stuff and how we go about doing it. And if you think about the origins of Bartitsu and the Bartitsu Club, you've got 
people teaching very reputable savant, box français. You've got people teaching very reputable wrestling, but I know Chapelon. You've got people teaching very reputable jujitsu there. Yep. We have reports of very reputable boxing there. So you've got arts which we know work, we know fundamentally work. They're tried and tested, have their efficacy. And they're put together for a defined purpose, which is specifically civilian self-defense. Now, if you look at other boxing organizations at the time, or single stick or wrestling, whilst people term these things as you know the manly art of self-defense, and you, you see those titles everywhere, much of it is still sportive boxing, isn't it? This is the first instance of tried and tested arts, or one of the first instances, tried and tested stuff that works for the bespoke purpose of just self-defense for, for him, you know, the early reality-based self-defense. So it, it must work given the cadre of instructors that he brings in and the nature of those arts, because they're not flim flam arts. They're, they're, they're decent fighting. You, know, you, you can't disprove any of those instructors are very, very good at fighting. That's what they're good at. Yes, but that, that doesn't mean that Bartitsu is good. You know, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't disagree at all. I think the, the individual instructors were incredibly skilled and very good at what they do. But I don't necessarily think that that means that Bartitsu is good. But anyway, we'll, we'll come on to that. Yeah. Let, let, let's talk about the, the, I mean, the evidence, the contemporary evidence yeah. about this. You know, the fact is he, he opened this club. And if we believe what we're told, that he brought these instructors from all over the world to come and teach at his club, uh, I'd, I'd love to see the proof of that. Because it's one of those things that said a lot, but nobody ever seems to be able to back it up. Mm -hmm. Um Yes, he, he spent some time in Japan, and yes, some Japanese people came and taught jiu-jitsu on his behalf. But, you know, so he opened this club. He generated a huge amount of PR for the time. Yeah. Um, and he, was, he had some amazing people there. You know, Hutton and his crowd were training out of the same room. They weren't part of Bartitsu, but they were training out of his, his, his room, if you like. Yeah. yeah, the club died pretty much straight away you know i mean it didn't it, what was it 18 months it lasted yeah but if you think about that you know the splintering of organizations is hugely prolific you know every single martial art on the planet has hundreds if not thousands if not tens of thousands of factions frictions fallouts and if you imagine at this time he's brought in such good instructors they come with an overwhelming dollop of ego you know, Vigny thinks he's the man, he's the Mac Daddy of Box Francais. You know, you look at all of his jiu-jitsu instructors, they're coming off the kind of, you know, the shiny new era of imperialist Japan. They're coming with, with ego and attitude and superiority. And all of these people are better than Barton Wright. But nowhere else, really, could you go to a club and learn from all of those types of people in a single place. So even if Barton Wright was nothing but a venue, even if he had nothing to do with the curriculum, the idea to bring that together for people in one place, such talent in one place, you know, it'd be like going to a modern you know, UFC gym and right, well, I'm going to be doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu with Nate Diaz, and then I'm going to do boxing with this guy, wrestling with this guy. You know, but that's, but that's, you know. that's not a new concept. You know, well, you, you can go back you know, what, 150 years before that, and you can look at the fact that um, John, the gentleman Jackson, who I've done a few videos about recently, he, he was training in the same rooms as Angelo. You know, and you could come along and you could learn wrestling and you could learn boxing and you could learn fencing. And that was all together in the same thing. And just because different people were in the same building, that's, that's, not, that's not revolutionary. That's not Barton Wright. You know, that's just... I think it's the unified purpose of it, though, isn't it? It's you know, the, the boxing that Jackson would have been doing, whilst he would have called it self-defence, would have been boxing, wouldn't it? It would have been boxing as is. He wouldn't have taught reality-based self-defence boxing. He would have, yeah, we don't know, but odds are you would have been doing boxing, boxing, as boxing would have been done at the time. I think the shaping of this, you know, shaping the arts towards a single purpose, one single self-defense purpose. I, 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 I see what you're saying. And I, and I, and I kind of get that Barton Wright came along and kind of put this umbrella over it all and, and gave it a name. 
But, you know, he then took that name and gave the same name to light therapy or whatever it was he was doing 10 years later, once the club, that was Bartitsu as well, you know. And when people talk about, yeah, we're doing modern Bartitsu, they're not talking about those weird and wonderful alternative therapies that have been proven to be hideously dangerous. They're talking about, you know, uh, uh, the Japanese jujitsu of Uyinishi or, or Tani. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it, I just feel that just because he stuck a name on it, people, it's given it a handle for people to hold on to and they've, they've kind of not let go. And, and if they want to do jujitsu, that's great. And if they want to learn historical forms of jujitsu or Lacan or Savat or what, whatever it is, then that's absolutely brilliant. But is that actually Bartitsu? Well, it would have to be, wouldn't it? Because Bartitsu is the alchemy of those. But in the same way, you know, you could learn Jeet Kune Do. And you learn Jeet Kune Do and you're learning a bit of sabbat and a bit of boxing and a bit of wrestling and a bit of judo and a bit of whatever else is the flavours brought into Jeet Kune Do. But the methodology is, is bringing that stuff together. It's not like Bruce Lee added anything new to his mix. There's nothing new in there. Most of Bruce Lee's book is Jack Dempsey's book and several other boxing books and several other fencing books. You know, there's, there's not much. And a bit, I like the parallel between Barton Wright and Bruce Lee in a way because Bruce Lee, huge... Hugely underqualified, if you think about it. Bruce Lee, not a great deal of time in Wing Chun, fucks off Wing Chun, goes and sells his esoteric and exotic stuff somewhere where there's a market. You know, that's what he does. In the same way Barton, right? He doesn't learn jiu-jitsu for a very long time, but he learns enough to come back and bring it to a place where it's exotic and it's new and there's a market. So, you know, I, I can see a parallel there. And obviously, Bruce Lee would have been an infinitely more talented martial artist than Barton. Well, right? And I think therein lies the difference, if we're being honest. Yeah. I think perhaps Bruce Lee had an ability to carry an art off the back of his own ability to do that art, you know? And, and, and he could sell it because he was physically impressive. You know, and you could argue that if I were to pay a skilled martial artist to teach in a room and then when people turned up to learn from them, try and sell them overpriced health fads that didn't work, that would also be Bartitsu. But that's also every modern gym in the world. If you think about it, you, you go to a modern gym now and you get sold creatine supplements, fitness program, you get sold a big jumble of bollocks, some which is good, some which is bad, but it's just, it's marketing, it's how you make a living, you know, no money, no club. You know, he was famed for having exorbitant fees. But if you think about his target demographic, it's very, very wealthy gentleman. So, you know, if your market- still failed. Yeah, it did fail. But I think that's, that's the fundamental element of generalists versus specialists. You know, if you look at that time, Orientalism is on a high. Everything that's already, you know, the Japanese nation has some serious PR and respect at this time. It's something new. People had seen Safat and they'd seen boxing and they'd seen wrestling. You know, their granddads, their great granddads had done that. It's boring, you know, this new sexy, shiny thing. And it's marketed by everybody. Everybody in jiu-jitsu is equally culpable for tricks and tips to defeat any man of any size. Of any, you know, jiu-jitsu is very guilty of that marketing spin, Barton right or nay. Every classical jiu you as a three, you know, six stone woman can throw a 20 stone man with ease. You know, they're all guilty of that shtick. Absolutely. But does that then not also play against Barton Wright in that effectively what he's then doing is going, oh, hang on a minute. These guys have got something that's good and works and they're already PRing the hell out of it. I'm just going to jump on that bandwagon and see if I can make a bit of cash selling some crap that doesn't work. I don't know, because the art's proper weakness, don't they? You know, I, I feel very confident in saying most of the Atemi was it, the striking stuff in jiu-jitsu, is an absolute bag of pants. It's mostly rubbish. You, <laughs> yeah. you, you plug in boxing into that, into that mix, you've got a decent system for punching and kicking folk that work. Most of the, you know, the wrestling game, the throwing, you know, you think of the, the jiu-jitsu that Barton and Yunishi and those guys would have doing, it would have been... Kansetsu waza based, kind of lock based takedowns as opposed to say a ballistic judo esque throw. But wrestling is ballistic throws for days. You know, so I see there are great ways to fill the inherent weaknesses in each art with the alchemy of stuff he put together. I think that's a very interesting way of shoring up the pros and cons of each of those things. 
yeah, and I, and I think that, that you, I can't argue that because I think you're absolutely right. But I think that that's not what he was doing. I think that may well be what you're doing. And other modern martial artists are looking at it and going, yeah, when we bring all this stuff together and we can do it like this. And, and, and I think that maybe you're crediting him with a lot more insight than he actually had. You know, I, I don't think what he did, what he did was as groundbreaking as people seem to say it is. Um, well, that, that's the role of marketing, though, isn't it? You know, he has, he, he has kept, he's kept his stuff alive where thousands of better things potentially have died because he put the work in in the awareness. Well, that, that, okay, that one I'll argue because I don't think he did. I think his stuff was dead, absolutely dead, and nobody knew who he was. The people that he paid to come and teach for him never mentioned him. They never talked about him in their later stuff, you know? And his, his club closed down, he moved on, he didn't do any more fighting stuff. He moved completely into the physical therapies and, and it just disappeared. And it's only because there was a magazine article where they misspelt Bartitsu as Baritsu that Conan Doyle clearly saw and decided it was exotic enough for home, stuck it in a book, and suddenly people are going, hang on a minute, what is this? And a little bit of research later, we find a club that closed its doors after 18 months, died out, and suddenly there's this great revival and people are saying he was, he was a, a fantastic innovator. No, he wasn't. He was crap. What he did failed. What we've done is look at it and go, ah, if you do it differently, it won't fail. And that's what we've got now. Oh, I, don't, I don't know. Be it, having yourself closed is not really a measure of efficacy because there's a huge number of business factors in having a venue closed. And for not doing it again, if you imagine you tried a business venture and you pour a lot of time and effort and money into it and it goes absolutely tits up and every egotistical instructor that you bought in that you might have thought was your friend or colleague has fucked off and opened their own iteration of what you do potentially somewhere else. Perhaps you might whole, wholly abandon that line of business. You know, if, you, if your initial line of business has your main guy's splinter off steal your market share and disappear. Maybe you wouldn't want to touch it again with a barge pole. And these are egotistical people. You know, no one can argue. You know, these are all off the showman circuit. You know, Vigny, Chapion, the, these guys will go on stage, fight people for money, make money, and have huge egos about it. So trying to rein those people in will be very, very hard. And it's, you know, you see every single mixed martial arts gym today where they've got famous people, famous coaches, famous fighters. Every six months, they break away and open a new club or do something different. Every six months. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm still not convinced. You know, having, having taught martial arts for the best part of 20 years, you know, and, and, and had clubs that lasted ooh, eight, nine years, I think was my longest running club. I think, well, I'm, I'm not sure I buy that, you know, and if what he was doing was good and if, you know, I mean, the, 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 the book, the jujitsu book from Uyanishi, this one here that I've got in my hand right now, he comes across as a really modest guy who, who gives credit where it's due. And he talks a lot about culture and differences. He never mentions Barton Wright. You know what? Why is that? You know, this is not a guy who's, who's really putting himself forward. And after a little while, he popped, he went back home. We never heard from him again. Um, <sighs> I'm not sure I buy the idea that they were all these big egomaniacs that, that, um, that destroyed the, the purity of Barton Wright's ideas. No, but they, they, they were more than happy to go and fight for money on stages and in show halls. And there's huge amounts of documented evidence of them doing take on all challenges work. So he can't be as meek and as humble as all that if he's willing to go do challenge matches for money in front of crowds for marketing purposes. You know, he, he can't be, you know, a complete Mr. Miyagi recluse. He must have some bit of showbiz about it. Yeah, may, maybe, maybe. Um, but again, that was a very different culture because that's, that's kind of how it was at the time. That kind of, that carnival take on all comers scene was, was, was really, that's the way grappling arts were done back then. Um, so, you know, the fact that he came along and he fitted into that scene for a few years and then went back to Japan, does that make, I don't know. I mean, you also got a factor in potentially there could be some sense of 
cultural xenophobia. If, if you think about it, Barton Wright went and did jiu-jitsu for two years. You know, we were actually doing jiu-jitsu his entire life. You know, he would have considered himself immensely superior in every possible aspect of jiu-jitsu. And all of, all of the Bart Titsu Club's kind of roster of Japanese instructors would have felt immensely superior in jiu-jitsu to Barton. I, I wonder if perhaps you know, they wouldn't feel in any way inclined to reference him because on the jiu-jitsu front, they would see themselves as clearly his superior. And they were his superior. I'm just not sure, especially if they've had business fallings out, why they would credit each other. Because if you look at kind of books made by karate associations, the Edo associations, HEMA associations, as soon as you fall out with people that were your colleagues, you either write about them and slag them off, or you completely delete them from your martial history and your, your writings, therefore. Yeah. Okay, but, all right. So if we've got well, at least four people that we know were senior instructors under Barton Wright, that we know by name, there may be more. Yeah. And they've all fallen out with Barton Wright and they've all gone off their own way and they've all done their own thing and they've all cut him out. Maybe Barton Wright's the, the, the problem. Well, I think with, with any enterprise, if you see people coming, you know, he charged a lot for his club. And if you come into that club and you see your money apportioned out, so you might think you're the star attraction because you're Uyaneshi or you're Vinny. You might think you're the star attraction. If you see your subs, your fees, Barton's taken a cut for himself and his venue. Each of the instructors will take a cut. Therefore, you know, we, we don't really know the payment model, but let's assume it was that way in that people got their, their aggregated cut. Yep. In a cash in hand style society as well, you, you would start to realize how much more money there is to be made setting up for yourself. You know, it's no surprise that they didn't all disappear and go back to the home countries or go do you know leisure pastimes they, they all saw the money and i think a lot of them saw the money that they could directly get themselves in their own bespoke club you know in the same way that any franchise model if you're in a franchise and you're coming in and part of that money is going off to head office eventually you'd be like i could do the same thing but all of that money could come to me yeah you know, it's a hypothesis but people act weird with money they always have to yeah. you know, and if if you, know, you, you follow the cash. If you're Vinny and you're saying, I think I do better classes than these dudes and I'm getting this cut, maybe I just open my own club. You know? And the hard thing with the jujitsu stuff is it's so unique and it's so exotic and it so matches the kind of orientalism of the time that for a lot of audiences as well, I think they want the organ grinder, not the monkey. So you might, have, you, know, you might go, I just want to do the new sexy thing, the new sexy thing that's been marketed everywhere. Yeah. So I think there will be a lot of, I think there would have been a lot more uptake of the jujitsu part of Bartitsu than potentially the Swiss wrestling. You know, yeah. by the way, you also really need to buy this book just out of interest. Schwingen. It's an amazing book, just full of tech. It's just a technique book, just tons and tons of Schwingen technique. Um, so if you're interested in Bartitsu, um, okay. <laughs> buy that because you're cool. <laughs> nice uh, little plug there. No, is, yeah, that, is that one of yours or is that someone else's? No, it's not mine. That's someone else's. It's from like the Wrestling Federation. But, you know, just to give you an idea, wrestling in cotton pants from the Alps is never going to be as sexy to a Victorian gentleman as this new amazing thing from Japan. And I think you know, it, it was always doomed to fail, I think, because of the personalities, the egos and the cash money. When you've got that much money, that much PR, think of it like Fire Festival. You know, suddenly you get to a point where you've got <laughs> That, that such, much buzz. Such a marketer, mate. Such a marketer. <laughs> that, that much buzz, that many names, that much excitement and that much ego. In a short period of time, something's going to go boom. Uh, and I think it did, you know, because it, it didn't disappear with a whimper, did it? It went with a, it just closed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's rumours of Barton Wright and Tani actually having, having a, an all-out fist fight. Yeah. And, and that effectively destroying the club and closing it. And, um, I mean, do we do we actually know any more about that, or is that just a rumor? I mean, uh, you, no, you, you've looked into it more than me. No one knows. No, no one knows. There's a rumor they had a fight. There is. It, it isn't even speculated if how the fight went. And normally, if there's no speculation, I think by fight maybe raised words and pushing and shoving, not fight, fight. Um, you know, if, if no one talks about a, and a lot of fights don't end in a clear victor anyway. It's just lots of shouting, pushing, shoving, and swearing probably in Japanese on Unesha's part. Um, but 
Yeah, it, it's hard. What I like about Barton Wright, I think his redeeming, his most redeeming feature was the thought experiment of it. And the man himself, the, I've got no doubt that most people I've ever trained with at a boxing gym anywhere in the country that were 15 could beat the shite out of Barton Wright. And I, I wouldn't have imagined him as a particularly a facious martial artist, but I do applaud the, the business acumen or the martial vision, and we don't know which it was, that brought some very effective things together for at least one significant purpose. And I like that. I like that approach and that, that appeals to me. The man himself, we know so little about him anyway, let alone the art, that it's his experiment that lives on. It's the experiment and his name, and, and, and that's really it. Um, but I will be investing in more fad therapies and publishing them in the near future. <laughs> Radium okay. way forward. Absolutely <laughs> <laughs> special radium gloves for you know for, for rapid application. <laughs> okay, well I, th I think I mean we've, we've pretty much covered it. Um, I guess we'll probably leave, leave the discussion there and um, agree to differ, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. You know, if if you're learning to punch, kick, throw people, and you enjoy it back then or today, and you think it works, and you've had a go at applying it, then. That's cool for me. You know, I think a lot of Bartitsu you can take the mick out of. And a lot of people that do it are phenomenally bad and phenomenally non-combative. And there's lots of people in the steampunk community that like to have a go at the dress-up elements. And that's cool. And that's fun. And every flavor of Bartitsu is different and probably none of them look like the actual Bartitsu. So, you know, it's a fun and interesting history. It's a quirky history, but it's unconnected, isn't it? You know, you look at things like suffragitsu and you... All these things, you know, Alfred Hutton inventing, reinventing Hema. It's just a, a brilliant zeitgeist. It's an interesting movement in time, which he's part of the tapestry. For good or ill, he's part of the martial history of, of Victorian Edwardian culture, which is cool. So there you have it. What do you think? Am I right? Or is Tommy right? I'd be really, really interested to hear your thoughts on this one, because it's, it's quite an emotive topic. Check out the new general history channel that I've just started. Amazing history. I'll stick a link down below. Um, there's only one or two videos up there at the moment, but I'm posting on a regular basis there as well, and hopefully we can grow that. Talk about some of the things that I can't talk about in this channel, because they're not about violence. Um, I'll see you soon. Bye! <laughs>